Hey everybody. We are in June. It's been going quick this year. We are going to talk about the deity of Christ. And you've already had a couple weeks of that, so I won't bog you down with the details. But the memory verse for this month is John 1.1, 1, 1, and it's, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Uh, and so we're going to talk about the deity of Christ, obviously, but in the New Testament. So we talked about why it's important. We talked about it in the Old Testament. This week we talk about it in the New Testament. And uh, if you're looking at your paper, you'll see that it is very verse heavy. I need people to know that the scripture is very, very clear. Christ is God. Now that's a polarizing statement. And either you agree or you don't. But from looking why it's important, from looking at the Old Testament to now, we're going to see in the New Testament Christ is evidently God. He is divine. So number one there, it says Christ has the attributes of God. That's the first reason we know that Jesus is God according to the New Testament. So I'm going to have you, when you go through this, go through each passage. I'm not going to go through all of them. I'm kind of just going to read some of them off to you. Some of them I'm going to uh, just... I put the passages for God on the other side, so how Christ fulfilled them, and then God on the other side, so you know that this is something that God does or is. Um, so we see omnipotence in Christ. If you look at Matthew 28, 18, it talks about how all power was given to him, and he does that right at the beginning of his great commission. So he says, on the basis of the fact that all power was given to him on heaven and on earth, then go. And so it's a beautiful thing, but he says he has all power. And in Matthew chapter 8, verses 26 and 27, you have the story where he's out in the o or the lake or sea is going crazy that they're on, and he's been sleeping in the bottom of the boat. And he basically tells the sea to be quiet, and it does. And they say, what manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? So his power isn't something to be questioned. He had power over disease. He had power over, uh, over the nature. He had power over death. I mean, his power is incredible. He had power over Satan. Think about that. He had power over demons. He had power over anything. Now, omniscience. He was not only omnipotent, but he was omniscient. So his omniscience is seen... And in a few different ways, you see him sometimes, he will read people's thoughts. Um, he'll read what's really in their heart. Uh, I've, I remember one person likes to call God uh, the omnipresent cardiologist. And Jesus read what was in people's hearts too. So in John 2, 24 and 25, it talks about how he needed no man to testify what was in the heart of man because he knew what was in them. He knew what they really believed, what they really thought. And it was not something he had to guess at or work towards. Jesus just knew it. And so it's really important to realize that Christ not only had all power, but he had all knowledge, even of what people were thinking. He knew exactly what the scripture was. If you look throughout the Bible, when they would, uh, in especially the New Testament, I mean, when they would try to catch Jesus in his words, they were always amazed at how wise, at how he always said the right thing. He always knew exactly what was going on, and he knew when they were trying to tempt him. Then we see Christ in his eternality. I mean, that's a huge thing about who God is. God has always been there. Well, Christ was always there. As a matter of fact, even part of our memory verse talks about that. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That in the beginning doesn't mean like, at creation, it's talking prior to. As far back as you can go, Jesus is face to face with God. And Jesus is God. It's a beautiful thing. You also see things like Colossians 1.17. It talks about how uh, all things were made by him and by him do all things consist. So he was before everything else. And in John 17.5, it talks about how Jesus was glorified with God before creation was in existence. And so you have this idea that Christ is eternal. You also see that Christ doesn't change. Uh, Hebrews 13.8 says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. 
And we're going to actually open up in Hebrews 1 right here, because this is an awesome portion of scripture that you need to know. It says, And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth and the heaven of the works of thine hands. It says, They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they shall all wax old as doth a garment. And as a vesture thou shalt fold them up, and they shall be changed, but thou art the same. It then goes on to say, And thy years shall not fail. It's saying, God, you created everything. You're going to end everything. They change. They go through differences. You never change. And it's saying that about Jesus. If you look at it in context, it's about Jesus Christ. Um, and then you see Christ as creator. And we just read Hebrews 1.10. So you see, in the beginning thou hast laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. Um, so you saw that, but you also have Colossians 1.15 and 16. And it talks about how Christ created everything there. Um, and we know, if you read the Bible, who's the creator? Well, God is. God's the one who created. Well, in the New Testament, it talks quite a bit about how Jesus created everything. Um, and then another attribute of God where it shows that Jesus is God is holiness. It's holiness. We're going to stay in Hebrews. We're going to hop over to Hebrews 7.26. It says, for such an high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. As Christians, we're called holy, but we're called holy on the basis of Jesus, who is actually holy. We're set apart. He is set apart from all sin. He's set apart from anything else. He is one of a kind. He's unique. He is holy. You also see this again in Hebrews 9, 14. So in Hebrews 9, 14, it says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge our conscience from dead works? So he's not only holy there, it's, it's not just, uh, it doesn't use the word holy necessarily, but the idea of being without spot, without blemish, uh, is the idea of to be separate from. So he is still holy in that picture. He's without spot. There's nothing that mars his image. He is holy. And so you see that Christ is omnipotent. He's omniscient. He's eternal. He doesn't change. He's the one who created, and he's holy. Those are different attributes of God. Why would Christ have those? Then we see that Christ does the works of God. Now, I want you to begin to understand this, and we're going to talk about the works of God. You have to understand that all sin is ultimately against God, by the way. In Psalm 51.4, David says this. He says, against thee only have I sinned. And he's talking about God. And that's in the context of the sin he committed with Bathsheba and having Uriah killed. And so you have to understand, even in that context, David realized his sin ultimately, even when it affected other people, it was a rebellion against God. So the first thing we see when Christ does the works of God is that he provides salvation. Um, you see in Acts 4.12, he talks about how neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby ye must be saved. In Hebrews uh, 12, 1 and 2, you get the concept that Christ is the author and finisher of our salvation. Here's what it says. Uh, we'll look at verse 2 specifically. It says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down on the right hand of the throne of God. So Christ is the one who gives salvation. And when you look in the Old Testament, the Bible talks about God being the one who saves. He's the one who does that. But Christ is the one seen to be the one to do it. Um, in the New Testament, we can see that Christ is God because he does the works of God in judging sin. Um, it's very important to note that Christ judges sin. We're going to turn to John 5.22, and we're going to do so uh, rather quickly. Now, this is a really, really important passage, and here's what it says. It says, For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. Think about that. God, who has the right to judge everything, God the Father, said, I'm going to let Jesus, the Son, judge all things. That's incredible. That's not something that anyone else should be allowed to do other than God. 
Now, it's interesting, not only does he provide salvation and Jesus judge sin, but he also forgives sin. This was something that got Jesus in some trouble here and there. This made people very, very upset with Jesus because they were not able to understand how a man could forgive sins. And let's talk about that in Mark 2, 7. It says, Why did this man speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? And that's a great question. Who can forgive sins but God? The problem wasn't that they came to a wrong conclusion. The problem was they missed the point of their own conclusion. This was God in flesh. You see things like that happening again in Matthew 9 too. And in the Old Testament, you talk, it talks again and again about how it's God who forgives sin. Um, we see Christ as the one who creates. And we looked at those verses earlier, so I'm not going to go through them again. But Christ created, and the creator was God in the Old Testament. He's the one who created. And if you need a picture of that, Genesis 1.1 says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. In the beginning God. But the whole New Testament talks about Jesus created, Jesus created, Jesus created. Not only that, but Jesus is seen as giving life. We're going to look at John again because there's some great passages here in John that talk about this. We're going to look at John 5.26, and here's what it says. It says, For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. Jesus just has life within him. And that doesn't just mean he's alive, but he is the essence of life. He gives it. Um, in John 6.33, we're going to look, and it says, for the bread of God is he that cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. And if you don't understand that Christ can give life, you just got to look at the different uh, people. I mean, Christ was seen raising at least three people from the dead. The most notable one would be, uh, the most notable one being Lazarus. And, you know, people were so mad that Jesus rose Lazarus from the dead that instead of realizing that this was the work of God, they decided they would rather try to kill Jesus and Lazarus. So not only that, but Christ proclaims himself as God. Uh, Jesus made eight I am statements, and I'm just going to read those for you, but they are quoting back from Exodus 3.14 when God told Moses, he said, tell them I am that I am hath sent you so you can go and retrieve the people out of Egypt. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He said, I am the light of the world. He said, before Abraham was, I am. He says, I am the door. He says, I am the good shepherd. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he says, I am the true vine. And you even get a couple more small things like this, but in the garden, Jesus asks them who they're seeking when they're coming to take him. And they said, Jesus of Nazareth, and he says, I am he. And when he does that, they fall back because the reality of who he was hits in that moment. And they get back up, and he says, whom seek ye again? And this time he lets them take him, but he uses that as an opportunity to save his disciples, to make it so they don't perish there, which was an incredible thing. But again, he's identifying himself as God, as the I am. Jesus called himself one with God, and this brought claims of blasphemy. And here's exactly what he said in John 10, 30. He said, I and my Father are one. Christ also is known for calling himself the Son of God. And in this same context, he said, Say ye of him whom the Father hath sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said, I am the Son of God. So apparently, him claiming to be the Son of God made them really upset. It, it caused an idea of him claiming the same nature as God, which he has. So we've seen that Christ has the attributes of God. We've seen that Christ does the works of God. And we've seen that Christ proclaims himself as God. Now, not only that, but Jesus Christ is proclaimed by other people to be God. Um, you see a very clear one of this in Thomas. He says, my Lord and my God in John 20, 28. Um, you see in John, in John 1, 1, he says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, depending on what Bible translation you read, it might say the Word was 
a god, and that is a mistranslation. There's a reason a isn't put there, and it's because the subject there isn't God at the end. It's the word was God. The word was God. It's showing you what he is. And so the word was God. It's said by Paul in Titus 2.13. It says, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, according to uh, a rule in Greek called the Grand Rule, Sharp Rule, these would both be talking about Christ, the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, and then in Philippians 2, 5 through 8, you have this passage. It says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but instead he made himself of no reputation. He took upon him the form of a servant, and he was made like into the likeness of men. Uh, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And so you have this great testimony by Thomas, by John, by Paul. And it's not only that, but you also get it by God himself. Check this out. We're going to be in Hebrews chapter 1, and I'm going to read you the section right here, and then I'm going to read you the context. It says, But unto the Son he saith, and he is talking about God, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. So unto the Son, God says, thy throne, or, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. So what happens when God the Father calls God the Son God? Here's the whole section. He's talking about how he relates to angels versus other things. And it begins by saying he was made so much better than the angels. And he has an, uh, he has a more of an inheritance than them and an excellent a more excellent name than they do in verse 4 and then as you keep coming down it says and again when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world he saith let all the angels of god worship him well who do the angels of god worship first of all they worship god don't they so why would the angels of god worship someone who wasn't god Verse 7, it says, And of the angels, God talks about them being spirits and his ministers being a flame of fire. And so, but when you get to verse 8, it's still talking about what God the Father calls the Son. It talked about what God the Father called angels, what he talks, how he relates to them. And now it's saying, This is how God the Father relates to the Son. It says, But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever, and a scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. And then verse 10 pops up. And again, this is God the Father talking about the Son. It says, And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. And that goes into that concept where God is saying, Jesus is God. He created everything. And it continues with the end of that section talking about how he will never change. Jesus wasn't some angel. He wasn't just some guy. Jesus was God in flesh, and God the Father announced that. Now, it's also implied that Christ is God. That's number five there. This is not something that a lot of people talk about, and I'm kind of weird for picking up on it, I think, but here's, here's the idea. You have, in the beginning, man was made in the image of God. In Genesis 1, 26, right? We're made in the image of God. We're meant to be like God. Not in every way, but we're made to be like God. In the New Testament, because, you know, the image of God was marred, we had sin now, and we're not just like God, and there's a lot of things that aren't the way they're supposed to be. But in the New Testament, we are then conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Think about this. If Jesus isn't God, and we were made in God's image, for us to be put in anybody else's image would have to be a form of idolatry. But we can be conformed into Christ's image because just like it says in Genesis 1, 26, and God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. God made man like himself. And that included Jesus Christ. So we're being remade into the image of God again by being remade into Christ. Now, we are still in the image of God before, but it's marred, and there's a lot of things that go with that. In conclusion, 
You may have heard this phrase, and it's probably soon to be lost with all the different things going on in our world. It says, if it walks like a duck, if it walks like a duck, if it quacks like a duck, if it acts like a duck, then it's a duck. Well, if one has the attributes of God, does the works of God, proclaims themselves as God, is implied by the word to be God, and others, including God, then they are God. I mean, think about that. The attributes, the works. They, he proclaims himself to be God. Other people proclaim him to be God. God says he's God, and he's implied as God by the way things turn out. Jesus is truly divine. The Bible is completely clear from Old to New Testament. Christ is God. Thank you.